by saying a few words about our, our next speaker, Dmitry Levitin, who is going to talk about scholarly and scholastic contexts for the general scholium. Um, Dmitry uh, has just intermitted or possibly left for good his fellowship at uh, junior research fellowship at Trinity College Cambridge in order to take up a post at the University of Edinburgh via the Folger Library which is where he is at the moment. Um, he's an expert on the history of scholarship in um, the 17th century and uh, has recently completed a book uh, which will come out soon on histories of philosophy um, and is now working, as you can tell from his comments, on the teaching of theology in 17th century England. Um, but this is, although those are broad topics, they don't really do justice to the range of Dimitri's interests as evidenced in his publications of the last couple of years, uh, which have presented um, wholly new views of the study of sacred history, of the writings of Matthew Tyndall and John Locke, um, of um, most recently uh, the, early, um, the religious position of Edmund Halley, uh, and just about to come out also uh, the work of, Ken of Newton's contemporary uh, John Spencer. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to what Dimitri will say um, which I'm sure will be iconoclastic as always about Isaac Newton. Thank you so much, Scott, for that uh, far too generous introduction. And, and, and thank you to you, to Stefan, and above all to Steve for inviting me to speak here and arranging everything. It's been absolutely impeccable and it's an absolute honor and a privilege to be here amongst such a fantastic collection of scholars. And I'm just relieved to see that some of the passages that I will talk about have already come up in other discussions. So, as you can see, my title is nice and alliterative, Scholarly and Scholastic Contexts for a General Scholium. But that's quite ambiguous, and you might be thinking, what is my paper really <coughs> about? And to answer this, I need to introduce the problem that I'm addressing and the argument that I'm going to make. And the problem I'm, I'm addressing is one central to the general scolium. It's Newton's vision of God's relationship to the world and how that, in turn, affects his natural philosophy. And I need hardly say that this has been a topic that has seen much spilled ink over the last few years, and of course there's been many different interpretations, but if you'll permit me just for a minute to uh, slightly lump together some of the recent literature, this literature, it seems to me, has suggested two things. First, it suggested that Newton had a metaphysics in which we're going to find the answer to these problems. And second, it suggested that this metaphysics was in some I use the word very vaguely and anachronistically, was in some sense animistic. That's to say that Newton's omnipresent God explains physical causation by acting as a medium through which matter interacts. And if I may, I'll quote at this point Andrew Janiak, this remarkable seminal book, from Newton's point of view, God in fact never acts at a distance on any object at any time in the history of the world. And this is what Andrew calls Newton's metaphysics, a non-empirical vision of God's action in the world that shapes the rest of Newton's natural philosophy. Well, I'm going to argue something rather different. And my argument, in contrast to some of this recent literature, is that Newton was deliberately and consciously agnostic about the precise nature of God's relationship with the world. Newton actively refused to say how God interacted with the world and what form God's omnipresence took. And the reason Newton felt this way was because he thought that such speculation was hubristic and overreaching and that his history had shown that it had led to both religious and philosophical error. And specifically, Newton thought that error characteristic of the discipline of metaphysics, which he roundly rejected as an intellectual enterprise. 
So that's my argument. And the first way I'm going to try and convince you that I'm right is by looking at the historical vision behind the general scolium. Now, as you know, in the general scolium, Newton says some rather ambiguous things uh, about God and about the history of philosophy and theology. Since this is, after all, a conference on the general scolium, I won't quote them for you, uh, but I'll just quickly remind you, here he's talking about God, and please notice that straight away he says that God is not the world soul. This is very important, we'll come back to this in a minute. And then we have the famously ambiguous passages about God not being duration and space, and so on. And then soon after, this is in the third edition, it's attenuated in the second, we have the following historical note. And here we have Newton famously saying that God is omnipresent not only virtually, but also substantially, and we'll come back to this very important point. And then that in him all things are contained and move, and then we have a long historical note claiming that this opinion was held by the ancients, some of whom he lists, and then further <coughs> on that idolaters also thought that the parts of the world were parts of the supreme God, but they were mistaken. So we already have this very ambiguous historical vision. On the one hand, the ancients were correct, to recognize God's omnipresence. On the other, many of them seem to have gone wrong in confusing this omnipresence for some kind of animism, which they turned into idolatry. Now, we simply can't understand what Newton means here without delving further into the manuscripts. And as I'm sure you all know, Newton composed around 1693 to four of a so-called classical scolia, intended as historical supplements to propositions four to nine of book three of the Principia, but even the classical scolia, I believe, are simply incomprehensible without the framework of Newton's other historical manuscripts. That's to say those composed from around the late 1680s onwards and mainly preserved in the Yehuda collection in Jerusalem. So what I set out to do was to contextualize the classical scolia in this way, and here are the results. Now, this won't make much sense at the moment, so let me explain. Speaking very roughly, Newton believed in four stages in the historical development of opinions about God and about the animation of the world. From around the mid-1680s, and Steve mentioned this very usefully earlier, Newton believed that God had revealed, uh, perhaps first to Adam, a primitive ur religion that went hand in hand with certain natural philosophical truths including heliocentrism and the inverse square law. But this true philosophical religion, if we may call it that, was inherited by Noah after the flood. And crucially, this philosophical religion recognized God's omnipresence. And here you have a nice quotation to that effect. There could be many more. So that's the first philosophical religion, which is group one on our table. But what's really important is group two, because according to Newton, the first corruption of this philosophical religion stemmed specifically from attempting to explain how God was omnipresent. And according to Newton, this led to what in modern terminology we would call animism. Through misunderstanding, trying to explain God's omnipresence, various pagans, beginning with the Egyptians, began to animate the world, attributing independent divinity to its parts. And this led to an anthropomorphic animist idolatry. And it wasn't just the pagans who held this view, because according to Newton, it was also inherited by the Greek philosophers. And that is why they're discussed in precisely the same way in both the Yehuda manuscripts and in the classical scholia. Newton literally says the same thing sometimes. And Newton thought this kind of animism characterized almost all Greek philosophers. So the Pythagoreans, the Platonists, and the Stoics with their world souls, but even Aristotle with his intelligent celestial spheres. If you want, we can later talk about where Newton gets this idea. 
And this is why Newton is so consistently scathing about anima mundi theories, not only in the passage in the general scolium, which I showed you a minute ago, but also throughout many other manuscripts in passages that I won't quote because they say more or less the same thing. And so, according to Newton, this second group <coughs> had achieved a mix of truth and error. On the one hand, they'd inherited the truth that God was omnipresent, but on the other hand, they'd corrupted that truth by positing philosophical explanations for how an omnipresent God actually interacted with the world. And this is what explains that ambiguous passage in the general scolium that I quoted earlier. Now, for the time being, the third and fourth groups aren't so important to us, so I'll just very quickly summarize them. The third is the atomists, and what the atomists did was rather than attribute motion to an anima mundi, they attributed motion to matter itself. So the atomists were also, in a sense, animists, but materialist ones. And this is important because it's the error Newton tells Bentley not to attribute to him in the famous letter from 1692. And the final group, group four, are the Cartesians. And for Newton, the Cartesians, in which for convenience at the moment I include Leibniz, uh, really stand outside this whole framework because their error was exactly the opposite of groups two and three, where those groups were animists, the Cartesians had gone in the other direction and removed God from the world altogether. And this is clear from many passages, but I'll just give you one famous one which we've had already today. This is the one from 1715, and you can see that Newton talks about his own philosophy as having an omnipresent God, but again, not as the soul of the world, but Cartesian philosophy, as represented by Leibniz, makes God an intelligentia supramundana. That's to say it places God outside the world. And obviously Newton isn't a big fan of this. As far as he was concerned, this was even worse than idolatry. It was almost equivalent to a kind of atheism. And he says as much in, in various places, or at least that it might lead to atheism. So. This is Newton's vision of the history of philosophy. And I could give lots more evidence from the historical manuscripts to back this up, but what does it have to do with Newton's own views on God's relationship to the world? Well, I think it's quite simple because it seems to me that if you accept this reading, then Newton is celebrating the agnosticism of group one and is thus portraying himself as also agnostic about precisely how God interacts with the world, since God is omnipotent and can act in any way he wants. Now, you might say, well, this doesn't prove anything. Newton might have thought that group one had a metaphysics. But what I'd like to show now is that Newton considered metaphysics understood precisely as the attempt to explain God's operation in the world as the archetypal intellectual exercise of those in group to the idolaters and the animists. Whereas his own natural philosophy, he claimed, was of course not idolatrous, precisely because it was not metaphysical. Now, Howard Stein says in his famous piece on Newton's metaphysics, he says at the start that the word metaphysics, I quote, was rarely used by Newton. Uh, and I must say this, this is just not correct, because Newton had a very precise vision of what metaphysics was and what its historical role had been. And here we have to turn to Newton's anti-Trinitarianism. Now, Newton's anti-Trinitarianism wasn't based on any kind of abstract reasoning. It wasn't based on his natural philosophical ideas. It was based on historical scholarship. And specifically, it was based on the historical idea that primitive non-Trinitarian Christianity had been corrupted by pagan philosophy. And crucially, the key step in this corruption was the intrusion of something that Newton consistently called metaphysics. Here you have a lovely quotation from the Yehuda manuscripts, the grand occasion of errors in the faith has been the turning of scriptures from a moral to and a monarchical to a metaphysical sense. And on the slide, there's another quotation to the same effect. 
But what did Newton mean by this? What did he mean by metaphysics? Well, it turns out that for Newton, the precise meaning of metaphysics was the hubristic search for explanations for how God operated in the world. Because Newton believed that the metaphysics that had corrupted early Christianity stemmed directly from the animist idolatry and philosophy that we earlier labeled group two, the sort of philosophy that posited an anima mundi. Again and again in the manuscripts, Newton tells this story about how what he calls, I quote, the metaphysical philosophy of the heathens was adopted both by the Greek philosophers and by the Jewish Kabbalists, and how it was this melange of Egypto-Greco Kabbalistic metaphysical theology that disastrously corrupted the early church. And here you have the quotation, could have picked another one, which expressly shows that Newton believed that metaphysics had its origin in animist idolatry, group two. This is a quotation which Stefan kindly showed us for approximately 1.2 seconds earlier. <laughs> Here it is for slightly longer. Metaphysics has its origin in the theogony of the pagans. That's to say, in our group two. And just as importantly, there's another quotation that links this story directly to the general scholium. This is from the Yehuda manuscripts on the history of religion, but you can see the last passage directly echoes the general scholium's emphasis on seeing God relatively. So we now realize that in the general scholium, Newton is making what he would have seen as an anti-metaphysical point. And this is what Newton meant when time and time again he said that his philosophy had nothing to do with metaphysics. Here you have a quotation, and I really can't see how Newton could have been any clearer that he was not doing anything that he thought could be considered metaphysics. But I hope I've now explained what he actually meant when he said this. What he meant was that he was refusing to offer explanations for how God operated in the world. God may have been omnipresent, but he was also omnipotent. And to fail to realize this would be to fall back into pagan idolatry or into metaphysics. They are, for Newton, the same thing. So we can now update our table. And it looks a little like this because you can now see that the error of the animists stemmed from their adopting a metaphysical approach. And this was also, Newton thought, the cause of Descartes' error, because although Descartes, of course, wasn't an animist, he thought that Descartes had shared the assumption that one could know something about the nature of God, when re in reality that was simply unknowable, except Descartes had done this through his doctrine of innate ideas. And here we might quote two very nice passages. And you can see here that Newton considers the chief crime of the Cartesians to be considering God metaphysically rather than physically. And so looking at this table that I just gave you, I hope I've started to convince at least some of you that to understand Newton's own project in the general scholium, we have to understand it as a consciously anti-metaphysical project, and a project in which Newton deliberately limited the extent to which he thought one could say something about God's relationship with the world. This is what I mean by Newton's agnosticism on the, knee, on the issue, and this is why in the general scholium, Newton's statements about God are almost all negative. He is not eternity, infinity, he is not duration in space. And just to hammer home my interpretation, Newton expresses this agnosticism quite precisely in a heavily redacted draft of the queries. Uh, normally, it's, it looks like this. Uh, that's completely useless, so I'll tidy it up a bit for you. And here we see that all the themes that I've identified come together. So according to Newton, 
the rejection of metaphysics means that we cannot know how several natural phenomena occur, including the interaction between soul and body and gravitational attraction. And from phenomena, the world may appear alive, animism, group two, but to speculate further and to try to explain this would be to return to the dreaded metaphysical arguments. And as Newton says, we must stop where phenomena are wanting. Now, this means that I think that John Henry is quite right. Newton did believe in action at a distance. He simply refused to say how it occurred, as he says quite clearly when he mentions gravity. And I think we don't need to attribute to Newton an elaborate metaphysics to explain how he solved the problem of action at a distance, because for him it was not a problem. Action at a distance existed, it proved God's ordering of the universe, but how it worked was just as unknown as how the mind interacts with the body. And there was nothing particularly strange about such a view in late 17th century English natural philosophy. Englishmen had been speculating about active principles for many years. Almost all serious Royal Society natural philosophers had rejected strict Cartesian mechanism. The big difference is that they tended to do it on a micro level. Newton did it on a macro level. But we can come back and talk about that context later. OK, so that's my interpretation of the historical material. But of course, those of you who disagree with me will no doubt claim that outside of this material, Newton does state how God interacts with the world. And in particular, you might point to two famous passages, one from the General Scolium and one or three from the notorious De Gravitatione manuscript. And here they are. Newton says, as we saw in the General Scolium, that God is omnipotent. Uh, omnipresent, not only virtually, but also substantially. And in De Gravitatione, he says three times that space is an emanative effect of God. So these seem to be much more positive statements than the agnosticism that I'm attributing to Newton. But are they really? Let's take them in turn. I might try and take off my jacket for this. <laughs> <laughs> roll up my sleeves. Now, to my knowledge, and you must forgive me if I'm wrong, no one has ever asked, historically speaking, what Newton might have meant when he attacked the idea that God was only virtually present. Although actually Stefan's paper this morning slightly touched on what I'm going to say, as you'll see. But if we turn to the Latin tomes of the late scholastics, the answer becomes, I think, quite clear. Newton was dismissing an utterly commonplace scholastic argument that substances, especially immaterial substances, may have a virtual extension. That's to say that they operate by their power, virtus, without having the properties of normal extended substances like parts and divisibility. Now, Edward Grant didn't discuss this concept in his justly famous study of early modern concepts of space, but it's present throughout almost all of early modern scholastic philosophy. And I'll give you three almost random but rather popular examples in this slide here. And as you see, for example, in his 1617 philosophy textbook, the Jesuit Pedro Hurtado de Mendoza, devoting a whole section <coughs> to judging the doctrine of the virtual extension of points. And he concludes that he admits virtual extension in spiritual substances, but rejects it in matter. And then he suggests that virtual extension explains the classical problem of how incorporeal objects could act on corporeal ones. And it's more or less exactly the same argument in lots of other texts, including the other two. Uh, and you see Luis de Ribas, for example, arguing that God is virtually extended. So virtual extension was a standard scholastic concept. And so just as standardly, it was attacked 
by lots and lots of different later 17th century non-scholastic philosophers. And they all said more or less the same thing, that virtue extension was basically meaningless, that either you have real extension or no extension at all. And you can find this in Descartes' friend and editor Louis de la Forge, who says exactly this. He says, uh, I won't say that the scholastics don't know the meaning of the words they use, and then he proceeds to say precisely that. And then you can uh, also find it in Pierre Petit, an experimentalist critic of Descartes and member of the Mersenne circle. And here you have him saying that extensio virtualis is scholastic nonsense. And indeed, he links it with the question of God's omnipresence, suggesting that the concept of virtual extension threatened rather than preserved omnipresence. And I should add that Petit's very interesting work was very well known in England. He was elected FRS in 1667. And indeed, in England, we also find this attack on virtual extension. So for example, and again, this is just one example of many, the physician Samuel Haworth argued that if the soul is not properly extended, it can't exert any action upon the body. And the, the idea that the soul operated upon the body virtually was just scholastic nonsense. And so Newton's statement that God is present substantially but not virtually is little more than an anti-scholastic commonplace. And this seems to me to be unconditionally confirmed by a passage from the Tempus et Locus manuscript from the 1690s, and here Stefan stole my thunder. This was first edited by Ted, of course. Where as part of an attack on scholastic philosophy, Newton writes the following, let the scholastics therefore consider whether it is more agreeable to reason that God is everywhere as regards power, virtus, and nowhere as regards substance. And it's obvious from the Latin that this is the same concept as the general scholium. So that's the general scholium. When Newton attacks virtual extension, he's not offering some kind of occasionalist, materialist, or God forbid, Spinozist metaphysics. All he's doing is throwing out the standard anti-scholastic commonplace. But finally, what about de gravitatione and the idea that we find there that space is an emanative effect of God? Now, from purely internal readings, this could mean anything. Is it a causal relationship, as suggested by John Carriero and then Ted? or not a causal relationship, as suggested by Andrew, or is it a logical relationship, as suggested by Stefan Duchesne? It could be anything. But luckily, as historians, we're not limited to internal readings. We have context to guide us. But it's been rather unfortunate that the only precursor to Newton in using this term, emanative effect, that, that the last half century of scholarship has looked at is Henry Moore who in the immortality of the soul says that an emanative effect is the product of a cause that acts simply by existing. Here you have a quotation. And this has given the misleading impression that Newton's discussion of emanation must have something to do with Neoplatonism. Well, this is deeply mistaken, misleading, sorry. Because if we delve not very deep at all into the Latin philosophy textbooks, we find that more was utterly not unique and that this is a very common concept. In scholastic philosophy, the language of emanative cause and effect had a very, very precise meaning. An emanative cause was, alongside its counterpart, the active cause, one of the first subset of efficient causes. It was a cause that functioned simply through the existence of an object from which was generated an emanative effect. And the standard example that they always offer was that heat produced by fire was an emanative effect, whereas the heat of any object heated by the fire was an active effect. And again, the reason why this was so important was because it allowed explanations of how the soul or other immaterial substances operated without themselves being corporeal. And this you find in any number of the most standard scholastic textbooks. And I won't bore you with all the quotations, but here you have Goclinius, uh, and you have a hugely popular textbook by Franco Burgersdijk. I could have also put up Adrian Hereboard's popular textbooks. It's also in Olsted's Encyclopedia, any number of other texts. 
And again, this popularity among the scholastics meant that it was a favored target of anti-scholastics. Uh, one example is Gideon Harvey's Archaeologia Philosophica Nova of 63. So Newton in De Gravitatione was using this standard scholastic concept. But that leaves us with two rather obvious questions. First, can Newton's use of the concept in De Gravitatione be used as a guide for his later statements about the relationship between God and the world, such as those in the general scholar? Well, the answer, it seems to me, is surely no. We simply can't read the term emanative effect into Newton's later works because everything we know about his intellectual biography suggests that he would not have used scholastic concepts in his mature writings. And even more importantly, emanative causation had a direct relationship with the concept we've just found Newton rejecting, virtual extension. So for example, Fonseca, when explaining how the soul interacts with the body, claimed that the soul is eminently or virtually capable of all the effects found in lesser forms. And Henry Moore, when responding to Petit, claimed something very similar, as you can see. And he even said that this meant that God's extension was not physical, but metaphysical. But as we've seen time and time again, Newton rejected such metaphysical approaches to these problems. But this leaves us with an even more obvious second question. Why did the young Newton use the scholastic metaphysical language of emanative causation? Well, one very simple answer is that De Gravitatione was written at a relatively early stage of Newton's philosophical development, around 1670, when he hadn't yet arrived at his anti-metaphysical and anti-scholastic dogmatism. But there's another possible explanation that seems to me to be more satisfying, because Moti Feingold has discovered a manuscript that shows that De Gravitatione was very likely part of a course of lectures that Newton gave in Cambridge in 1671. Now, it would be far more understandable for Newton to use scholastic metaphysical terminology that he didn't agree with in such a pedagogical setting. Indeed, this is exactly the practice recommended by John Locke, who also thought that metaphysics was a nonsensical discipline, but nonetheless recommended that it be incorporated into a course of philosophy study for young students. But whatever the reason, I hope I've been able to generate a bit of skepticism about using De Gravitatione as some kind of metaphysical key for Newton's mature natural philosophy. So I've got only about a minute left, so I'll just very quickly conclude. And my argument is very simple. It's my contention that Newton's rejection of metaphysics and of metaphysical language led him to broadly the same conclusion as his most devoted follower on these matters, Samuel Clarke, that divine omnipresence is as impossible for our finite understandings to comprehend or explain, yet that the thing is true, we are certain. But on the basis of this conclusion, I'd like to very quickly just make two broader points. First, when I say that Newton wasn't doing metaphysics, this isn't some kind of Skinnerian language game or just a matter of words. It matters how the people we study organize knowledge and how they frame their disciplines. And here I, I'm responding to what Andrew said about using uh, actors' categories earlier, which I think is quite right. So if someone says they're not doing metaphysics, we have to take them seriously. And we have to try to explain what that meant to them and how it shaped their ideas. In the same way that we no longer speak of early modern science, but we speak of early modern natural philosophy, we simply won't understand Newton's intellectual project unless we take into account what he saw the relationship between various philosophical disciplines to be. And this leads me to my final point. And this may seem a, a particularly perverse thing to say at a conference on the general scholium, but I think that perhaps the general scholium is simply not so important for explaining the rest of Newton's natural philosophy. <laughs> or to put it more precisely, in the general scholium, Newton only tells us what he is not 
He tells us that he is not a Cartesian, that he's not an animist, that he's not a metaphysician, and that he's not a scholastic. But these things we probably knew already from elsewhere. And it's with that thought that I'd like to finish. Thank you very much. Yes, first of all, very interesting talk. I have a very simple question. You, you said it in the classical scholia, uh, Newton refers to the fact that uh, in the, in the original, original religion, original philosophy, uh, the ancients were agnostic about the omnipresence yes. of God. Can you, can you tell a little more about which passages are you referring to? Um, this, uh, he doesn't say this in the classical scholia. This is in the Yehuda manuscripts. I, I mean, but Noah doesn't come up in the classical scholia. And incidentally, uh, Moti, I think, made an important point earlier that S Newton's interest in different forms of history leads him to much greater skepticism about what one can or can't say about Noah and his sons after 1700. I think that still doesn't affect the table because Newton still believes that there was a corruption. I mean, the real important group is group two. Um, when does Newton say, I mean, Newton, there is a passage which I should have put on the slide when Newton does talk about they did not attribute causes to action, uh, to God's actions. Uh, I should have put it on the slide, really. But this is, I mean, you're quite right. I am taking this from what he says about group two. Now, the what the bigger issue almost that your question raises is, and this is a, an issue that Andrew asked about earlier, how does Newton think we know that God is omnipresent um, if it's not through metaphysics? Well, one way is through revelation, but he does say in Tempus et Locus, there is a passage where he talks about omnipresence which finishes and we only know God from his works. And I think he does think we can know omnipresence from works, but in the way I described earlier. That is to say, God's wor works reveal that there is a creator. Because there is a creator, he must be uh, omniscient, omnipotent, and so on. I mean, this is a standard chain of reasoning that you get in any <coughs> classical theism. And from that, it logically follows that he is omnipresent. But what? The historical question, why does Newton even begin talking about omnipresence? It's, it's an anti, for me, it's an anti-Leibnizian, anti-Cartesian point. He, he doesn't have a, a very developed idea of, of God's omnipresence. All he wants to say is that I'm not pushing God outside of the world. That's really the point he's making when he says God is omnipresent. <laughs> thank you. I'm going to keep running, Andrew. Cap, thank you. And also, um, uh, I was like just glowing through the paper because I, you've done a lot of the hard work I should have done years ago, um, arguing against Andrew on a lot of points. But um, I was concerned about um, a passage um, and how you treat it. Mm -hmm. Omnipresence es non per vut tutem solam, sed etiam per substantiam. It seems to me that you dropped the solum there in your reading. The first line. The, it's the line, uh, he's not only uh, virtuous oh. present, he's a, you wanna treat, it seems that you treat, uh, treat it as denying virtual presence. Yes. And rather than endorsing virtual presence in addition to substantial presence. And that complicates your story. Um, it, indeed, if he denies virtual presence, then your argument against Andrew, I think, goes through quite nicely. But it looks to me that he's indeed disagreeing with the scholastics, but that's because he wants both there, rather than denying that he's saying anything about the way God operates. So um, I'd like you to clarify the word so long. Fantastic. This is a, a, absolutely the right question, and indeed, I haven't actually given you the full story because 
I have a suspicion, but it is at the moment, well, perhaps forever unprovable, that when he says God is not only virtually, but also substantially omnipresent, he is not only targeting the scholastics, but he is targeting <coughs> also Descartes. Because Descartes, in his correspondence to Moore, which of course would have been available to, uh, to Newton, says that uh, we cannot understand either God or angels or our minds uh, uh, the extension as, ex uh, as uh, a substantial extension, but the extension of power, potentially. So this is again this concept of virtue extension. So in fact, yes, to uh, come back to, it's not only virtually extended. Yeah, I mean, this still fits into my idea that he's basically agnostic about this, unless he thinks something dangerous is being said. And he thinks the idea that God is only virtually extended is dangerous. So he'd be quite happy to say, yeah, maybe he's virtually extended. He doesn't know because that's not the sort of philosophy he does. So what I'm, I'm worried about is, is, regardless of action at a distance, mm -hmm. he should have denied virtual presence and just have stuck <coughs> to substantial presence rather than claiming they're both. I, I, I completely see what you're saying, but I, I mean, this isn't going to be very... Should we let Andrew Oh, sorry. Back? Of course. Uh, we, we'll come... No, no, you're right. We should come back to it. exercise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this uh, really outstanding. I have, a, um, and some people don't like when uh, folks object to them, but I love it. When they object to me, that is. <laughs> <laughs> Not them. Um, um, but I, 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 the agnosticism, I think, is difficult to see, and I'll tell you why. Um, and it fits with what Eric was just saying. I, I do think <coughs> that it isn't just a scholastic view. I mean, saying, look, I'm, I'm, not, a me I'm not doing metaphysics in that bad old way Lots of them would say that. We're the moderns and they're the. But there is another sense of metaphysics, namely first philosophy, yeah. that Newton is perfectly well acquainted with, that is modern, that is Descartes and later Leibniz. And he, as you know, thinks Moore is absolutely right that Descartes is caught in a bind because Descartes, amongst everyone else, thinks God is virtually omnipresent. Some people don't realize that, but Descartes accepts that. Moore tries to get him to say, you can't accept that unless you say God is also substantially omnipresent. That is a well understood uh, topic in metaphysics, not of a scholastic kind, but of a first philosophy kind from Descartes, also something that Leibniz is interested in, that Newton f fully well understood, and he is taking a substantive position in that, under, in that domain of first philosophy against a Cartesian view in this text. Now, the question is, um, is that consistent with what Newton says he's doing in, in favor of his own attitudes, namely, uh, I'm just studying the phenomena, I'm not doing metaphysics, mm -hmm. and I'm only going to tell you things about God that I learned from the phenomena or from divine revelation. I think that's very difficult to square because he is saying in this text that an actually infinite being is substantially omnipresent in an actually infinite space. And how you would know that, either from divine revelation or from studying phenomena of a f in, in a finite world, is not at all clear. So I think you're maybe giving Newton too easy a time in saying, which I have been accused of in the past, in saying, uh, similar to a uh, hypothesis non fingo, I am not doing metaphysics, I'm simply analyzing the phenomena or the scriptural text when in fact he's taken a position in a well understood debate within first philosophy, one that is not limited to scriptural interpretation or uh, experimental analysis. <laughs>
that makes sense. Fantastic. Yes, you've raised a hugely in, uh, important issue, which I really wanted to talk about. We just don't didn't have the space. But the paper I've actually written is 22,000 words, so there are a few more things to say. But that issue is how did people define metaphysics in the early modern period, of which there is not a single good study. There is, well, there's Charles Lohr from the 16th century, but all other studies are completely anachronistic, including Robert Pasnow's latest metaphysical themes, which on page four announces that I will be adopting a modern definition of metaphysics, to my great disappointment, although he says many other useful things. So how did early modern philosophers conceive of metaphysics? And this, of course, stems from Aristotle's own definitions of metaphysics. And basically, they had two, well, two and a half definitions. One is the study of being qua being, which, of course, we've all heard of and is famous. The other one is as theologia naturalis, as natural theology. Now, if any of you remember the first line of Henry Moore's Enchiridion Metaphysicum, it is metaphysics is theologia naturalis. And what he spends the next 20 pages doing is attacking that metaphysics is the study of being qua being. Now, where does the idea of metaphysics as first philosophy fall in this? That's an even harder question. Incidentally, there's no clear ideological division. It's not that Catholics say it's being qua being, Protestants say it's natural philology, theology. There's a real mix, and it's even more complicated because in English universities, they're quite happy to use Catholic metaphysics texts. What is the kind of metaphysics text that Newton may have come across at university? Well, the kind of metaphysics text Newton may have come across is Christoph Scheibler's metaphysics. And where Scheibler says, that metaphysics is, he tries to have both definitions, but what metaphysics for him studies is immaterial created substances. <laughs> metaphysics reveals the knowledge of substance. Now, Newton obviously completely rejects that, and I think quite consciously. When he says we don't know God's substance, the substance of the material beings, I think he knows exactly what he's saying. But your point is about metaphysics as first philosophy. Well, let's, lots of people do different things with this. Hobbes plays this game. Hobbes says quite uh, deliberately, all these Aristotelians have completely misunderstood what Aristotle actually meant by metaphysics. Aristotle, all Aristotle, and Aristotle himself messed it up because he included natural theology in it and logic. All metaphysics is, is first philosophy philosophy, and we shouldn't use the term uh, metaphysics at all. In Descartes, it's very complicated, because for Descartes, metaphysics is both first philosophy and the study of immaterial substances. That is to say, before you do philosophy, you have to have a notion of God and the soul, and that prevents skepticism, and then you build philosophy, natural philosophy. So there, metaphysics is first philosophy. But Newton simply never says anything like this. And if you want Newton to come out of the Henry Moore tradition of metaphysics, that's not at all that tradition. For Henry Moore, metaphysics is theologia naturalis. And in fact, it's not really clear why, I mean, Henry Moore uses the term metaphysics, but it's all from phenomena anyway. I mean, hen what Henry Moore means by it when he practices it is complicated. So you can't have him being both a Henry Moore metaphysician and a Cartesian metaphysician. They actually have quite different views on metaphysics. And indeed, Moore is a critic of Descartes on this. So I just don't see where does Newton say that metaphysics is first philosophy. I mean, that's a view he would have known about. You're quite right. But I think the things he says about the metaphysical tradition as it was conceived of at the time just don't allow us to, to say that. Now, I'm very tempted to let this run on as long <laughs> as possible, because it reduces the time that you'll need to listen to me. <laughs> but um, I've been warned that I can't do that. So I will give the last word, although I have two papers for it, I will give the last word to Professor McGuire. Thank you. Pardon, you no, no, I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll be stumped <laughs> for a reply. <laughs>
flowing argument, which Newton never uses. It's an argument you find in the Cambridge tradition, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, the uh, Cambridge Platonist tradition, especially in Moore, that nothing can exist unless it be extended. Yes. All right? No, if, uh, if God is going to exist under the criterion of extension, it better be a special sort of extension. So Moore argues that divine extension um, is, is, is um, intrinsically non-divisible. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so that way he can give guts to the, the concept of, uh, of omnipresence. Yeah. I, 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 uh, in fact, the idea that God exists substantially. Yeah. Okay. That's the point. Now this is a really interesting argument, non-traditional, not part of the th uh, not a part of the uh, theistic tradition, but it's one that Newton never avails himself of. Yeah. And could have, and yet he knew these guys quite well. Yeah. Could you may, uh, give me a comment on that, please? Fantastic. Thank you. I, uh, that that's again that's a hugely important question. Now more, I think there's been a <laughs> more is much more. Much more is much more cautious than he's often presented as. In his earlier works, in the, in the Immortality of the Soul, Moore does really uh, say, you know, God is extended. But then he really. Right, he starts using all this sort of stuff, the old scholastic concepts, and he uses them in traditional ways. But is this really, to say that God is extended, is that really. Actually, before I go into that, I should have said, uh, but Haworth, I didn't add because we didn't have the time, but when Haworth attacks uh, 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 virtual extension, it's as part of an attack on what Moore calls Hollenmarianism, on the attack that uh, the soul is totally in every part of the body. So there clearly are, you know, that discussion is, is happening of all those issues, but I think it's happening yeah. well beyond. Here's where it is. Yeah. Now, but is saying that God I is extended really <coughs> so radical? Oh no, well, clearly it's too radical for the powerful. Uh, if you'll forgive me, there is one slide I'd really like to quickly show you before we finish, as long as I included it. Right. 1661, theological lectures at Cambridge. God is present in everything by his nature, by his essence. Later on, God's Im immensity and intimate presence in everything according to his substance. This sort of stuff is being said, and Pearson is, you know, this is a high Anglican, he does not he is not a Cambridge Platonist. He is not keen on all, all those kinds of speculations. These are completely, you know, orthodox theology lectures. I think we need to be a bit cautious about positing a Neoplatonic tradition. These things get said by quite a lot of people, and the focus on Henry Moore, I think, may have slightly diverted attention from other people who are saying this just as interestingly. But that's only the beginning of an yeah, answer, yeah. and I, I can't pretend to. Yeah to be fully answering you. That's a very interesting quote. Well, perhaps we, we can wrap up here. I'm just going to make one remark. Um, I often set my students um, an essay by Gautier Tocco in which he describes what the different, uh, what, what intellectual history is, what the history of ideas is. And there he says, uh, he gives an account of going to a conference about David Hume where he says there were historians present and there were philosophers present, and that it rapidly became apparent to him that the historians and uh, philosophers meant entirely different things by David Hume, <laughs> and that it wasn't that those were bad things or on either side, um, but that they were uh, mutually incompatible, and that there was no dialogue and no exchange whatsoever. Well, I think Dimitri and the participants here have managed to demonstrate that at least in this small sense, Pocock lacked uh, optimism at least, even if perhaps he may have been, and even perhaps that he may have been wrong. Because clearly here, historians and philosophers have been able to talk productively about Newton and one or other